Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. Once again, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Joanna Ritchie. Hi, Joe. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. How was your weekend? Weekend was good. Just getting a lot of stuff ready for the course. Oh, Got to keep go. those students on their toes. I headed away from the heat to the Midwest, and now it's just hot and humid. Traded hot for hotter. All right. Well, we have a phenomenal show for you today. Our guest is from Dallas, Texas, Dr. Larry Lavery. Dr. Lavery, welcome to Dean's Chat. Thanks, Jeff. Great, great to, for us to carve out the time to do this. We tried to do this about a month ago, and the hospital interrupted my evening. So I appreciate you rescheduling. I think you would have had more fun hanging out with us that night, Larry. I, I, I'm sure I would have. <laughs> Nothing ruins a night like gas. Gas yeah, gangrene, yeah. to be specific. <laughs> well, we're already on first name basis, so let's roll with it. Larry, Joe, and Jeff. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. So what I'd like to do, Larry, is give you a little more formal introduction. You are currently a professional professor in the Department of Plastic Surgery, as well as the Director of Clinical Research in the Department of Plastic Surgery at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Your research group has published over 320 peer-reviewed papers. You've received funding from the Veterans Administration, the National Institute of Health, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the American Diabetes Association, and the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, um, you are truly a leader and a thought leader uh, in the diabetic foot space worldwide. Uh, as evidenced by your H index, you've got a H index of 108. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But the first thing I'd like to ask you about is I understand you've got an impending move to take your research, if possible, to another level. Yeah, so the uh, in about a month, I'm going to... Uh, go back to the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, um, where I uh, did my residency training and stayed as faculty. Um, so I'm going to go in and join uh, Lee Rogers is the is the chief of podiatry. Um, I think a really great opportunity uh, to, uh, I mean, first of all, kind of be that, as you can see, the guy with gray hair to, to be able to mentor some students and residents and uh, also be able to, I think, build a build a research program there. And uh, you know, it's, it, a, a lot of my, I, I was talking to Larry Harkless uh, the other day, who was the chief of podiatry there, and kind of helped build the program. And you know, my research questions came from what we discussed about clinical case, clinical cases, um, and you know it always included a discussion of what was in the medical literature. And so that was really the foundation for, you know, for, for a lot of the research that I did. Um, but so I'll tell you this. So I, I went to the school in Chicago and I was interested in research and writing. I've always been interested in writing. Um, and so I asked the person who was in charge of the diabetic foot clinic over one summer, I was like, look, I'm really interested in uh, diabetic foot complications and in research you know, is there anything I could do? And and he said that to, this was 30 years ago, 30, you know, five years ago, said, you know, pretty much it's all been done. So wow. I was like, huh, I didn't think it had. Um, and I know now it's just, we're, you know, the, the interest in the diabetic foot internationally and the research for the diabetic foot has just grown tremendously. And so I've been lucky enough to, uh, I think I've trained at a place where someone like Larry Harkless was very inquisitive and, you know, wanted to foster an academic atmosphere um, and then had lots and lots of patience um, and, and some people to collaborate with. That's fabulous. You know, I, I want to go back and talk about the early stages of your career and the formative years of research. But before we do that, let's define this H index of 101. Um, when, when I, or 108, I'm sorry. When I say that, can you tell our audience what 108 
H index means from a research perspective? Because not a lot of people yes. know. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a metric that 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 is used uh, for for research, and it basically means whatever your H index me it is. So if it's a hundred, it means your you've had a hundred papers that have been cited by other authors at least a hundred times. So it's, it's kind of a measure of how many papers you publish, but it, you know, if they were meaningful papers that other people are going to use them, it's what I try. It's what I tell my wife. So she's still not convinced. Um, she's not impressed. No, she's, no, yeah. I mean, like your wife, my, you know, my wife and I met when we were in college. And so none, none of this is, she, you know, she, she knows all my, all, all the hidden secrets. So she's not impressed. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So Joe, what do you think about that? I mean, as a young faculty member at the college, can you imagine having a hundred peer reviewed papers or 108 that other people are citing over 108 times? It's unbelievable. It's completely unbelievable. However, I'm not shocked considering all the breadth of your work, Larry, in terms of the contribution to the profession. It's not, a, as, as I heard that number, of course, my jaw hits the floor, but it's not a shock because of how much quality, high quality work you have conducted over the course of your lifetime. But I think really what is remarkable, Jeff, is if you, we had talked a little bit prior, if we look at this in context of norms. <laughs> I'm not going to say what my H index is because I was proud of it until today. <laughs> but if we look at this in terms of norms, you know, like a, a quote unquote good H index is, you know, 12 to 15, maybe 20 is like, wow, right? So if you put that into perspective and yours is 108, I think that really is a strong testament to the kind of work that your career has contributed to. So I'll give you the little any sound effect yeah. of a round of applause because I mean that's remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Larry, Larry the the thing I, I'm sorry. The thing I learned was that Nobel Prize winners usually have an H index of about seventy, and yeah. yours is one hundred and eight. I mean, you truly have pushed the diabetic foot to places that it would have taken a lot much longer to get there, and you not been a driving force. So, what do you attribute that driving force to? I mean, I you mentioned. Uh, school in Illinois, but you did. Were you always inquisitive when you were a little boy in, in school, or were you always wondering what the next thing is, or where'd you get all that? So, so I think I, I think I was fortunate to be to to be educated in an environment that that really fostered writing, and and you know had people to mentor me, and then. You know, in various scientific medical realms, you know, kind of raise that interest as well. Um, and, and, and so, you know, as a resident, you know, Larry Harkless, you know, really was interested in having a scientific basis for what we did. And so, you know, if you think back, so I graduated, um, my first year of residency training was 1988. So if you think, so Roger Mann wrote the one volume textbook that was one of the first foot textbooks. Um, you know, McGlamoury's textbook was still not yet done. And so, you know, there there wasn't a lot of great evidence. Um, and so, you know, it was a, you know, it was a, it was fertile ground. Right, right. Uh, can you kind of uh, describe the environment of San Antonio? I know Larry Harkless was a driving force and you were there. Um, what was it like with so many residents, all with like the sky's the limit when it comes to research and, and having potential opportunity? Um, yeah, so it was a program where we would have, you know, 10 students a month. So we had lots of students. I think at the time there was a pyramid system for residency training. You know, at the time I finished, and, and, and the same thing for you, I think we're just a few years apart. Um, half the people in my class that residency training. Wow. And I think at the time there were three or four three-year programs in the country. Um, I was the first resident in San Antonio that did three years of training. Um, and so, you know, it was, 
you know, that was the environment. There weren't a lot of opportunities. Um, I was, uh, I mean, we, God bless Larry Harkless because he spent a lot of, I mean, it takes a lot of time to train people. And we had like three conferences a week. You know, we had, uh, we had a, we had a conference where we went through pre and post op patients from six to nine on Wednesday mornings. Um, you know, we had a, a conference on, you know, one morning a week where basically residents lectured to each other for, for two hours. We had anatomy lab and journal club and, um, you know, really, really uh, kind of demanding academic involvement from residents and students. Um, and we had a busy hospital service in a large county hospital. Um, and, you know, so it was just, it was, it was, it was very busy. And I think, you know, kind of set the, the groundwork for, you know, being intellectually curious. So, so I'm asking some of these questions because I, I used to do a fair amount of writing grants too, Larry, and I enjoyed writing and I did it when I was on, when I could have been skiing or something, right? I enjoyed writing. Uh, what, when you sit down to come up with some ideas and write a paper or an outline, what's your environment? I mean, are you sitting at home drinking coffee? Uh, you, you need peace and quiet to do that. You have to be away from the clinic with all the patients. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get down to the core levels of what makes you tick for writing. <laughs> so early when I was, new, when I was new faculty in San Antonio, um, so I had, I had a, a series of Dutch research fellows and on Saturday, I used to get up at five, I'd make an ex, a thermos of espresso, a couple bagels, and I would go to the office and I would write from 5.30 to 10. And, and I was, you know, I was uh, excited to analyze data and write. And um, I would come home, my wife would have been up for an hour. I wasn't in trouble. Um, and it was a really, you know, a very productive, you know, time period. So when Dave Armstrong, he was probably the second diabetic foot fellow in San Antonio. Dave and I would meet, uh, so, so for those of you who don't know, David Armstrong was a residency mate of Jeff's. Yep. And so Jeff, yeah. Jeff, Jeff has, uh, Dave Armstrong tales. If you probably for another time, um, totally. So, so, you know, Dave was, Dave was in, you know, it's like, Hey, I'm going to go, you know, why don't we meet on Saturday morning? And, we would do a couple drafts of a paper. And as you know, Dave Armstrong was an early computer adopter, had the best, best computer, best software. Um, the first grant I bought, or first grant I got was, uh, to, to actually it was my MPH thesis. It was $66,000 and I bought SPSS version two. Um, I I uh I got one of the first versions of Excel micro and Microsoft Word. So now I don't know what SPSS is now version 28. So, <laughs> you know, a new version every year. Um and we were rocking. We had uh you know, we we bought you know, like a new computer. It was we bought a laptop. It was awesome. Um and um so we we were uh, you know, we, we were just excited to, to write. And I think, um, like the, the, the university of Texas diabetic, but also classification, Larry Harkless was invited to give a, a European presentation on ulcer classification. And he asked me to help him prepare it. And so I did that. And Dave Armstrong came as a fellow. He was like, we need to, we need to publish this. Well, I, I wanted to have some data. So we published it with the concept and then we got data and then we published that in diabetes care probably the next year. Um, so, you know, it was just, so now my writing is a little bit different. Um, I will, we have a really busy hospital service where I'm in the OR on Mondays and Wednesdays. Andrew Chrysologo is going to take over in Dallas is in the OR on Thursdays and Fridays. 
and I will write between cases. So, you know, half hour, 40 minute room turnover, and I'll like work on the discussion for a paper all day and write, rewrite a version of the discussion. Um, uh, you know, for, for me, it's, it's like a hobby. I enjoy doing it. Other people, you know, they feel like, uh, it's, it's punishment. So, you know, if I can, if I can have a couple of hours to, to finish a project or, you know, make a table as, uh, kind of absurd as it sounds, you know, I, I really, I really enjoy the discovery part of it and, you know, completing a paper that, you know, has something novel to, you know, what I, what I, my goal is really to change clinical practice is to look at things that are novel and uh, will help other people look at, you know, the diabetic foot and clinical, the clinical application a little bit differently. I, I think you, I think you've done that. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Joe, your thoughts. So I, I have a question for you. Um, I love what you had just mentioned about discovery, the curiosity part, the discovery part. And you're right. Writing is um, not everyone is blessed with the writing gift. Um, so the practice component, the consistency component. But one thing, too, that I that I uh, again, this is the first time I've met you, Larry, but just knowing some of the, the, the breadth of your work. What I can appreciate is your growth mindset, this idea that you'll come up with a question and then in that question, you're willing to be proven wrong with your hypothesis. Can you talk maybe a little bit about maybe things that have surprised you or how your creative process works in regards to things like a growth mindset? Um, yeah. So, I mean, so, so one of the things I think when you do research is like, I don't, I don't care what the results are. I mean, okay. Sometimes I think I, I know what the results are and sometimes the results are what you think, but then sometimes you're surprised. Yeah. And um, like one of the things that has been a lot of fun and we're, we're working on the manuscript now is looking at the incidence of acute injury, acute kidney injury in diabetics that are admitted to the hospital for moderate and severe foot infections. Um, and I, I honestly, I really hadn't paid that much attention. And like, uh, like a lot of the stuff that I end up doing, it what starts with a clinical question. So I had this guy in the hospital, you know, 290 pound guy with a foot infection who had lost a leg, who's like 42 and, uh, and like a, like an adult downs syndrome person. Um, whose mother lived on the far side of Dallas and it took her like two buses and a train to come to the hospital. So she's seeing him like twice a week and he has an acute kidney injury and his, uh, and his kidney function just tanks. And, you know, I talked to the nephrologist and, and happily I'm dosing this guy's vancomycin and I get a call from the, uh, the farm D and he was like, Hey, this guy was admitted to the hospital like four months ago and I dosed his vancomycin. Would you, would you mind if I just dosed his vancomycin? And I was like, yeah, thank you. I mean, I was like, I, and he dosed his vancomycin and his kidney function just took this dive. Um, so I'm, you know, re really concerned about this guy and talked to the nephrologist and he's, he's not, he's less concerned. So I started paying attention to acute kidney injury and um, we wrote, wrote a paper from a retrospective data set a couple of years ago in, in uh, the journal, journal of American Podiatric Medical Association, we're doing some prospective work. We have better, some better variables, um, but it ends up like a third of patients end up with acute kidney injury. Often they are missed by medicine. Um, and there's some, you know, new AKI scoring data, but that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I think is really interesting. And I mean, it doesn't really affect the foot, but an AKI event is a marker for people Sliding down that, you know, chronic kidney disease slope towards dialysis and dying sooner. So it's, um, you know, it's just it's just a piece of medicine that you know it's easy to ignore. You know, I'm just doing this foot, um, but it's kind of fun to when you start putting all those all those pieces together. 
And then I think you start paying attention to um, the antibiotics and the other drugs people are started on um, in the hospital and, you know, some of the other outcomes. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, one of the, one of the series of publications that, that I've really enjoyed is I've been involved in the international working group for the diabetic foot for, Oh, actually I was one of the, I was one of the founding members. Um, but I've been on the infection writing group for a while. And I mean, when I trained, there was really a strong sentiment that if you had osteomyelitis, you had to cut it out. We'll worry about how we deform your foot later. And it, it's not necessarily the view of people in medicine or ID people. Um, and so I think the thought process of, you know, we can treat your osteomyelitis medically. How successful is that treatment? You know, what are the limitations of, you know, what has been published in, and, and a lot of the osteomyelitis literature isn't good. It's really small studies. They reuse poor surrogate markers for outcomes. Sometimes they do a poor job of defining osteomyelitis in the first place. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it's fun to go, we, we need to study this in a more rigorous way and maybe we can improve outcomes. So those are kind of the two, you know, fun, you know, fun things, I guess, um, that kind of come to mind. That's interesting because when you published that last uh, international working group infection uh, work uh, piece of work, I, I looked at the antibiotic treatments for osteomyelitis. I think there were 14 studies. I don't know if that rings a bell, but um, you're right. I was looking at it thinking, yeah, in some cases it works, but in a lot of cases it doesn't work. So is that where you're going with this, Larry? Is like we're going back where we were 25 years ago, 20 years ago? Well, yeah. And I think if you look at the outcomes, people are defining success, successful treatment of osteomyelitis as wound healing. Well, if you look in the literature, there aren't there's not a lot of evidence that says osteomyelitis is a risk factor for your wound not healing. There's so many other variables that affect wound healing, like your treatment. I mean, if, 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 if you get bad treatment, you know, and, and, and treatment is neglected in, in a lot of risk factors or reulceration. Well, people that have never had osteomyelitis have a really, really high reulceration rate. And we don't go, you're reulcerated. It must be, you know, osteomyelitis. So it's kind of, and, and the studies are small. I mean, you know, there's maybe there's four or five prospective osteomyelitis studies now, and there are less than a hundred people, you know, so like, you know, the NIH, that would be an interesting pilot study, but not something that you would go, man, they're not like the 10,000 people lipid studies or, you know, where you have, long follow-up, lots of risk factor evaluation. You know, we're still, we're still, uh, I think at our infancy, you know, trying to understand this. So it's, it's, it's kind of fun because I think uh, whatever we learn, it's going to be, it's going to be novel and it's going to help us change treatments. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, I'm sorry, Joe, I'm being kind of a clinical nerd here. I had one more question for you, Larry. Um, you know, if you, I, you know, I've been involved with the total contact casting stuff for years. And, and yes. as I've trained doctors in using it at wound care centers around the country, more and more doctors are treating osteomyelitis with IV antibiotics and they want to cast those patients. And it's always made me super nervous. Um, cause once the bones involved, it's a deeper wound, the tendons can be involved in it. You know, it, it seems like a, a, a bad route to take yet. I'm getting reports. Cause I usually say, you know, it's a clinician decision. People are saying they're getting good outcomes from it. And, and, yeah. but I haven't seen anything published that just knocks my socks off either. No, your thoughts. And, uh, so I, so I agree with both things. I think you have to be cautious, but I've also, I've, I've, I've been able to cast people and heal over their, you know, osteomyelitis. And, you know, especially if you're going to treat them medically. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're exploring a bunch of things like monitoring biomarkers to look at treatment outcomes or, you know, see if it influences your, your decision-making. And we kind of have, 
you know, I think our decision making is biased because we, uh, I mean, I think right now we think we believe the biomarkers and maybe we shouldn't. Um, but you know, I think there's a bunch of questions like that. Um, I think we, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a long way to go to try to put all those pieces together. I wish there were more people that were that paid attention to offloading when, you know, we should have the problem of telling people stop putting people in the cast. Um, you should. Yeah, no, instead of I'm, instead of the opposite. No, I'm I'm with you. Um, it seems to me that the more you know, you less the less you know is you know that's old saying, of course. Joe, jo, your thoughts. I think this is such a great discussion because, again, it kind of goes back to that idea of like key principles. What is it like rules are meant to be broken, but principles are there forever to like guide. And so to your point, Larry, like trying to figure out which ones are rules and which ones are principles, like and within the bounds of safety for our patients, how do we as a clinician make the best decisions for our patients when we don't have evidence to support some of the decisions that we're making? Like to your point, you know, the long-standing idea was if there's osteomyelitis, we have to take it out, surgically excise it in order to receive a cure. And there's been some interesting things pop up that maybe refute that a little bit. But the risk there also then lies in if we don't surgically excise it with clean margins to eradicate this infection and we try to treat it medically, what is the risk if it comes back and it has spread? Because now maybe they could have ended up with just a toe amputation. Now they're ending up with a ray amputation or a transmetatarsal amputation. So the prognosis associated with a progressive incident is much bigger. And what's hard is, again, as a clinician, you don't want to put a patient at that kind of increased risk. So if we have some data, if we have something to help us um, strategize that risk or prioritize kind of what our clinical decision making, if we see certain things, if there is erosive change on x-ray, if there are markers, if there is some kind of quantitative data that we can use to help make those clinical decisions, that is, to your point, how we change and impact clinical care. And it's a really great conversation. And and I'm again, I'm I'm so grateful to be a part of a community that wants to continue to raise the standard of care, raise the bar in terms of how we treat patients and not just accept, we'll just cut it off. But then when is it right to make that decision? And and again, I think these are the questions that we're trying to define. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I think it's, um, you know, what I really love medical mythology. You know, it's like, you know, is your... Or, or, or trying to prove it's if it's medical mythology, or, or if it is really, you know, something that should be part of our, our, our belief system, our practice pattern. And so many times when I ask people, so mostly, right, I'm, I'm uh, asking fellows or residents, you know, why did you do that? And many times the answer will be, well, that's what I was taught. And I'm like, well. What, what if you were taught by someone that didn't make good decisions or. All right. So Larry, in terms of the progression of the profession and the changes that you've seen over time, where do you think we're going in the future? Um, so, so, so I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of. That's a smile. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so I think there's I think there's a lot of places for us to go. I mean, what I'm excited about is there are more opportunities in academic medicine. Um, I think there are more opportunities for people that are well trained to be part of large multi specialty groups. Like, but you know, there I think there are more opportunities for people to be like the diabetic foot hospitalist or partner with vascular surgeons which I think is a very natural, uh, fun pairing. Um, and, you know, so, you know, part of my interest, especially being able to go back to San Antonio and work at the, at the University of Texas there, um, is to kind of change the paradigm of education for students and, and residents. Um, 
And, uh, you know, so, so Jeff, Jeff and I were, you know, kind of raised at a time where there was, you know, t- people talked about the Socratic method and then people were like, oh, we don't like that. That makes people uncomfortable. Um, but kind of the Socratic, the, the foundation of the Socratic method is as a teacher, I ask you a question and as a learner, you respond, but you're also prepared to engage me and ask me a question. So it's it's an exchange. It's not, you know, I'm like I'm not like the mother bird bringing you worms and stuffing them down your throat. You know, we're there's a, a mutual agreement that, you know, that you're just as a as a learner, you're just a younger colleague of mine, and I'm helping you and with your goal, which is to to be to excel at whatever we're learning about. And so it, it, it is not fun, as you know, as a, as, as a, a teacher to play the game by yourself, but it's a lot of fun when, when you kind of say, well, you know, we're playing this game, these are the ground rules and I'm really interested in new knowledge. I'm interested in sharing new knowledge with you, but I can't be more interested in your, and then you growing than you are, then it becomes fun. So, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm excited to go back to teach because I have, uh, cause I'm interested in looking at the problem. And I think in a, in a different way than most students, uh, or residents have, have been oriented. Um, and so I have a lot of clinical observations but I also try to wrap that in what the evidence says. And I'm and I don't believe I don't believe my own evidence. I want to see it two or three times. Um sometimes it points me in a good direction, but um I just think it helps us discuss how to take care of a particular patient in a better way. And um uh, without beating without beating people with it, uh, especially if we're if we're on the same uh you know if if we're if we agree we're 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 doing this exchange uh for the same reasons um then it's fun and fulfilling and we're and you're bringing new information to me and questioning you know the paradigms i believe in and i'm doing the same to you um i also have to be willing to go ah, i really don't know why i do that or this is my reasoning maybe there's a better reason um so uh, you know, one of the reasons why I'm going back is I, I, I really like to do that. I, I like when people want to, uh, have that exchange with me. Um, and I think it's a, it's a better learning environment, but it, it, it also isn't fun when y- you don't want to play or, you know, you don't want to play the game. Um, so, you know, evidence-based medicine is, uh, it, it, I think is kind of predicated on us at, at, you know, together wanting to do the best for our patients. Um, so, I, you know, I really, I really, really, you know, I really, I really enjoy clinical medicine. Um, and my interest in research has always been for me taking care of a patient and wanting to have the best information for them and not, and not go well this is a hands-on tradition and um, I just believe that. So um, the other thing that I'm really interested in is training the next generation of academic podiatrist. I've had, I've had research fellows from Europe, from Australia. Um, I've had American podiatrists. Um, you know, the people, some of the leadership for the international working group on the diabetic foot, um, were my fellows 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Um, Dave Armstrong was one of my fellows. I, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, take responsibility for too much of that. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, so in San Antonio, we're going to have research fellows, uh, you know, and, um, so, there aren't that many, I think it's unusual in medicine for people to be interested in, you know, in discovery and in research. Um, 
but I'm, you know, I would like to have people that are that are excellent clinicians and excellent researchers and being able to place them someplace in that they can, you know, really contribute. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my one sales pitch, Jeff. Um, you know, Larry, I think you're going to really enjoy this upcoming generation of yeah. students. Um, we've got a class coming in this year and classes that are currently at the school that have research experience in undergrad and are just passionate, passionate about learning. So um, you're going to be seeing a steady stream of Arizona students coming through Arizona for sure. Good. You know, right. I, I want to come out and talk to to the students a month after quail season starts. That's fine. That's perfect. I, I you are all, you have an open invitation. Um, thanks for opening the door. Let's talk about what you like to do when you're not involved in podiatric medicine. Um. So, you know, I, I, I like to read nonfiction. I like to, um, you know, before this conversation started, I was telling Jeff and Joe when I interviewed uh, at the University of Texas, I was talking to the dean and chairman of uh, orthopedics, and, and, um, and they were, you know, asking about my writing productivity. You know, they were asking about my writing productivity, and I said, you know, it's like it's a hobby for me. I said, you know, I I like uh, I like to write. I like bird dogs and shotguns, and you know, and you know, if the weather weather was better, I would like hunting more in San Antonio. You know, if it doesn't rain, we don't have quail here. I've actually been traveling to Arizona a couple times a year to go to go quail hunting. Different. It's a different. Uh, it's a it's a We lost the year. Yeah, yeah. There we go. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, those are the, uh, you know, those are, you know, I kind of, I grew up, my father trained uh, English pointers and I have German short hair pointers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm lobbying my, my wife for another, but she's not a, she's not a nice person. Um, I just, I'm just joking, honey. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, that's, uh, so I, I know, I know Jeff is a, a, a trap and skeet shooter. Uh, my brother was the coach of the trap and skeet team at West Point for a couple of oh. years. Um, and you know, I, I was an adult before I, before I did that, um, before I, be, before I was ever at a trap or skeet field. So it's a lot of fun. There's, there's, a. Uh, there's a couple of nice places to shoot in San in San Antonio. Um, so, so Larry, every year in October, I go to San Antonio for like nine days and shoot the national sporting clays tournament. It's the home of sporting clays down there. Yes. So you, yeah, you're going to have ample, like you have lots of shooting everywhere down in Texas. So, so the, the, so that's where they had nationals for collegiate nationals for trap and skeet. Yep. Um, re really a fabulous facility. And usually the week before nationals, they had, um, I think it was a big uh, shooting tournament for, I, I think veterans, um, but they, they have some really fun, uh, fun, fun shotgun shooting events, um, in the area. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, in, in Dallas, Dallas has some great places, uh, as well. So, uh, it's, that, that's, that's I, quite I, I have corrupt. I've corrupted a number of European physicians by taking them shooting, and then you know they questioned all the bad things they heard about shooting. Um, right. So, yeah. I think you hit the trifecta: research, dogs, shotguns. Life's good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, Joe, do you have any last questions for Doctor Larry? Larry, I'm sorry. So I loved what you had said about the engagement, um, this idea that it's not as much fun to talk to yourself, essentially, or talk at people. So if you were to give incoming students, and these could be students that are prospective coming into podiatry or any health profession or specific to our podiatric medical students, what advice would you give them in terms of starting that process and learning how to engage with faculty? 
So when, early when I was a faculty, so I, so I have to say, one of the one of the lovely things about Larry Harkless was he was very open to young faculty presenting new ideas or, or going places to learn. So McMaster University used to have a week-long course about teaching critical appraisal. And their their medical school approach is, you know, you're in the you're in the clinic right away. And so you have a reason to go and read about biochemical pathways that have to do with diabetes because you just saw Mr. Garcia and his glucose was abnormal and he has retinopathy. And you know, so you have so your your clinical experience helps drive your your why you're trying to understand bio biochemistry, you know, instead of like raising your hand and asking, you know, this is if this is going to be on the test or I really need to know it. They give you a context. And so it, it takes a special teacher and a special learner because the way we're taught is, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you for 45 minutes about, you know, this topic and there's going to be a test and not, you know, there isn't often, you know, the reason for you to learn this mixed in with that. And so what I tell residents and fellows and students um, is you need to read about the people that you see in clinic. And then like Mr. Garcia with his diabetic foot ulcer and osteomyelitis is going to stick in your brain because, you know, there's that, there's that clinical link. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it it gives you a reason and a context for, you know, exploration and having foundational work and then building on that. Um, but it, it, I think it takes a special, uh, you know, it, it takes in buying from the group and it's, a, it's a lot more work for everyone. Um, but I think it's a lot more enjoyable. Absolutely. I, well, so I'd absolutely. like to be, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when you, and Bob Freiberg and Lee Rogers are brainstorming the next round of research. That's awesome that you guys. Me are too. It. Can we can we get it on that? <laughs> you know the the uh, you know it's you know it's it, there's a there's a there's a few more people in the mix in San Antonio um, that I think are gonna are gonna make this even more fun. There's some some people that have some passion and some new new ideas. Um, and so it, it's going to be, and, and I think we, we have some support and opportunities from the administration there. So it, it should be a lot of fun. I think you're going to, uh, I think you'll see some, some people involved in sharing their ideas, um, you know, in the next, in the next few years from San Antonio, um, that I think if, if we build, build the opportunity for people to kind of wrap their uh, passion and include research in it, that that they'll enjoy doing it. And it'll be a, 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 a clinical contribution um, to, to the process. So, um, you know, I, I think when, I think when you have when you're when your research has clinical endpoints, you know, pe people like to use it. Um, so yeah, I and think I, it should be fun. And I think Absolutely. with the three of you as mentors, that is, um, I don't want to say an expected outcome, but it's something that you can just logically see start to happen. And so I guess my last question for you, and then I'll hand it back to you, Jeff, is if you were to talk about some of the main mentors in your life, your career, who, who comes to mind for you? Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I would go back to like, uh, fifth grade. I had, I had a, I, me I mentioned his name. His name was Ron Bendel. And, uh, he was very innovative teaching fifth graders, you know, science. And, um, we had, you know, in elementary school, we had science projects and, you know, very, uh, engaging for young minds. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I, I had, uh, really great English department. Donna Guerrero, who lives in San Antonio now, um, was 
was the English teacher that you know probably encouraged me most to to write. And my brother had one of her friends, uh, Mrs. Lynch, and and he took all of, of Mrs. Lynch's classes, and I took all of Donna Guerrero's classes. Um, and so, you know, kind of that writing part was, you know, uh, someone to challenge you, someone to make you make you write every week. I think was a big uh, a big motivator. I mean, uh, and and then I think in my in my academic career, I think it was Larry Harkless because, um, you know, he he challenges people, and I think you know he throws out ideas, and you know, and I think it's really engaging. I mean, Larry was one of the first people in the United States to have a dive back foot course, and I think a lot of the ideas that that we had in San Antonio, like having workshops and things like that as part of the meeting um i think we're we're done we're we're done uh in the in the late 80s and and 90s in san antonio um so i mean he he was a tireless guy he's like the guy that sleeps four hours a night and is um you know and 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 just has a tremendous a tremendous work ethic um so i i think you know, he's one of the guys I think a lot of people, um, you know, in this generation don't don't really know his name, but I mean, he's he's really has had uh, a great a great positive influence, and he still does. I mean, he's still active in uh, in San Antonio, and you know, a lot of the people that trained with him, you know, I talk with him, you know, on a regular basis about you know about things. It's still. Uh, you know, he still has uh, he still has a novel perspective. Uh, um, Larry, I'll give a shameless plug. Uh, I interviewed Larry Harkless. We had three episodes because you know how Larry is. You get talking and wow, <laughs> next thing you know, we're 45 minutes into it. So we did three episodes of his career and and I've gone back and listened to them. And I, I think that we're capturing a lot of podiatric history in yeah. talking to Larry. Um, I thoroughly enjoy chatting him up on, on, on any topic, really. So he's, I can see why he's a mentor for you. Well, Larry, thank you so much for joining us on Dean's Chat today. I've been so looking forward to this interview, and it was fabulous. appreciate you carving the time out. Yeah, thank thanks, you so much. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Thanks, Joe. Pre I appreciate it. And we'll be sending you a Dean's Chat coffee cup because, uh, you know, when you're making those thermoses of espresso, when you get to San Antonio, you're going to put them in something, right? So we'll get awesome. Dean's Chat cup. All right. Sounds well, good. to all of, all of our listeners out there on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a five-star rating. And if, of course, if you're watching on YouTube, please become a subscriber. Uh, and we will continue to bring you phenomenal interviews like today's with Dr. Larry Lavery. Thanks again, Larry. All right. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. So much. Thanks, Joe. Bye-bye right, now.